Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Let's dive uh, in immediately. So I think everyone knows this talk is about Starlink. I think most of you know how Starlink works and what it does, but it's a satellite internet system. So as with any satellite-based system, you have a space segment and an Earth segment. In the space segment, we have satellites. In this case, these satellites might communicate with each other over laser links. And basically, the idea is that the user terminal will send its data up to a satellite, and then the satellite sends it back down to an Earth-based um, gateway. And then in that way, you can connect to the internet. Now, for some reason, SpaceX wouldn't give me a satellite, so we had to buy a user terminal. And that's what this talk is about. This talk is about the user terminal, and the idea here is if you can attack the user terminal, you can access more of the network infrastructure that you cannot access without first attacking the user terminal. So we bought one. We put it up on the roof of our university building. I did a speed test. But that's about it, because at that point, we have another internet connection, and we already had a good one. So I started looking around at what other people had done. Um, and there had been a few teardowns, like Mike on Space did a teardown, Ken Keeter did a teardown. The signal pad did a more in-depth analysis of the RF hardware. And then that's basically the point where I started working on my dish. And while I was working on that, a few other videos came out. Colin O'Flynn did a teardown, and he went uh, really quite ham at the dish. He used the blowtorch to open it up. Oleg Kutkov did a, a teardown of his Wi-Fi router and did a basic analysis of it. This is all documented in a nice blog post. And then recently, um, Dan Murray did a teardown of his second generation Starlink terminal. And he also made a 3D printable case to replace the broken one. But basically, what was lacking for me in all of these things is that they, none of them really went into the security of the device. And that's the part that I was obviously interested in. Now, I already mentioned that there have been multiple hardware revisions of this user terminal. But I think very few people realize how many there actually have been in the past. So the circular user terminal, the one we have here on stage as well, is about 60 centimeters in diameter. It's meant for residential use. But as you can see, there have been a lot of hardware revisions of this specific dish. You can also see that there has been an SOC CUT 3 and an SOC CUT 4, meaning that there have been at least two silicon revisions of the main system on chip in this dish. Then we had the square user terminal, which is slightly smaller and square. There again, there have been at least three revisions of the hardware. Finally, we have the high performance units, uh, meant for more business and, and other uses. Again, there have be already been two hardware revisions of those. Finally, the transceivers. Um, there's not that much publicly known about these. Um, so I know from the code that there's at least two revisions. And the idea here will be that you have a transceiver unit with an external antenna. For this talk, we will focus on the circular user terminal. Um, I specifically worked on a Rev2 Proto2 and Rev2 Proto4, uh, which means that I did the attack on the system on chip CUT3 and CUT4. All of the other terminals use a CUT4 SOC, so the attack that I present today works on all of these. Um, so, of course, we started with a teardown ourselves. Um, we removed the plastic shell of the user terminal, and then you uh, are greeted with this um, enormous metal shield. There's a small cutout that shows you three connectors. The first one is a power over Ethernet connector. Then there's a connector for the motors. So normally, this dish is on a stand that allows it to orient itself towards the satellite. Then the final connector is unpopulated, and it contained a UART interface. Now, those of you that have done hardware stuff before know that if you see a UART connector, it's always exciting, um, because oftentimes you find an easy root shell on the device. Now, that wasn't the case um, for this SpaceX terminal. Um, so we can see that it does use U-boot. But the input is set to null def, meaning that whatever input you provide over the serial connector, it won't accept any input. So you, you cannot just get to the U-boot command line interface and change kernel command line arguments. Uh, when you allow the dish to completely boot, you are greeted with a login prompt. Um, and as you can see, it prints development login enabled. No, because obviously the hardware you buy is not development hardware. This also means that whatever you will enter in this user, user login prompt, um, you won't be able to log in. So this meant basically that we had to go deeper. We had to remove the metal shield from the board um, to see what's on the inside. As I said, it's, it's really quite big. It's 60 centimeters diameter, um, 
which is definitely the largest board I had worked on. So some areas that we can identify on this board, there's a GPS receiver chip. There's an area related to power over Ethernet. There's um, a part of the circuit that generates clocks for both the SOC and other RF hardware. Um, then we have the area that contains the SOC and DRAM and EMMC. That's the part we're most interested in for this talk. And then, of course, there's one area of this dish that I haven't marked, and that's all the other stuff. And all the other stuff looks like this. So in the middle, we have a digital beamformer IC, which is made by STM, and it's codenamed Shiraz. Each of these beamformers has 16 front-end modules connected to it, which are codenamed Pulsar. Now, while I was working on one of these um, dishes, I, I got a bit too excited. I broke one. Um, SpaceX was nice enough to replace it. Um, but I didn't want to just throw it away. So I desoldered a few of these uh, beamformers and front-end modules, and I sent them off to John McMaster. Um, and John was nice enough to decapsulate these chips for me and image them. And starting today, I think you can all uh, view these chips online and really zoom, in them, zoom into them in like, high resolution. Um, another thing you can see, like some basic things you can see here, like on the left we have the, the beamformer I see, and you can see that there's 16 parts that repeat, and these are basically the 16 channels of the beamformer. The pulsar chip, or the front-end module on the right, we can see that it's basically symmetrical, meaning that there's a receive and transmit path for this chip. Then the area that we are most interested in, so um, the biggest chip here is the system on chip. It's a custom quad-core um, ARM Cortex-A53 made by STM. As I said, there have been multiple silicon revisions of this chip, and this one is codenamed Katzen. We can also see that there's a secure element. Um, at the end of the talk, I will give more explanation what the secure element is used for. Then uh, finally, in, or uh, C in green is a four gigabyte EMMC chip. This is basically a fancy SD card, you could say. Um, and then there's uh, eight gigabits of DDR3 memory. One thing you can see here is that the main system on chip is in a flip chip style package with an integrated heat spreader, so a metal can on top. If you remove this metal can, you are greeted with the backside of the chip die. And from the backside of the die, you can also make an image of the chip. So this is an image we made in our lab. Um, so it's a two substrate image. It's at 50x magnification. And this is an interesting picture for us as a physical attacker because it allows us to narrow down certain interesting regions. So for certain physical attacks, you want to precisely target a specific area of a chip. And here, for example, it's, it's very obvious where the four CPU cores are in this, in this big chip. Um, the full resolution picture will also be available online. So the next step for me was to extract the firmware from this dish, to look at the software and maybe find an easy vulnerability to get into the, into the dish. And to do that, I had to extract the EMMC memory. There are several ways of doing this. Normally, I would um, extract the chip from the board and, and then dump it that way. I didn't want to do that in this case because I was afraid of breaking the board. Um, so I soldered basically wires to all of these small test points, hooked up a logic analyzer, and then restarted the dish. And then from this logic analyzer trace, it's uh, very easy to spot which uh, test points you need. So to read an EMMC chip, you only need a clock, command, and D0 line. So if you want to redo this at home, you now know which test points to use. As I said, this is basically an SD card, meaning that you can also use an SD card reader to read out this chip. In this case, I had to attach um, a level shifter because the EMMC is working at 1.8 volts. Um, what I would recommend you do if you want to recreate this at home is that you order a low voltage EMMC adapter by the exploiters. It's only $12 and it's very convenient to have. That's what I use today, but I was too impatient and that's why I made the other setup. So once we have a binary dump of the EMMC, we can um, start pulling it apart into the different pieces. The GPL code that's available on GitHub is, is nice for this because it contains all of the offsets and sizes. So you can see that there are trusted firmware pack, uh, boot stages. These are firmware image packages that you can extract with a FIP tool. There's a flattened UI image tree um, that you can extract with dump image. Then there are a few extra partitions, a runtime, a calibration that is unique for each dish, an EDR partition, and dish config. And as you can see, all of these partitions are protected cryptographically. So they're either Verity signed or Lux encrypted. 
And of course, the uh, trusted firmware boot stages also implement secure boot. So this means that we cannot easily override our own firmware to the EMMC chip and get a root shell. Um, that would have been too easy. If you want more information on how you can extract this firmware, there's a blog post online that explains it in more detail. Uh, I often get questions about the firmware um, and how certain things of the system work. So one thing people have asked in the past is how does the, the thermal management work? Like how hot can it get before it shuts off? If you dump the firmware, there's a very nice file with a lot of comments that nicely explains how the thermal management is implemented. You can also find all of the um, RF channels that are being used, the frequencies they use, and the up and down link channels and how they are paired. You can also find the frequencies of the, um, the lasers that they are using for the satellites, because part of the code base between the user terminal and the satellite is shared. Another thing we can see from the code is that they collect a lot of telemetry about what you're doing with your user terminal. I know that some people have mounted their user terminal on top of a car. I've even heard of someone mounting it in their plane. You can be sure that SpaceX knows if you did this. Another thing that SpaceX does is they keep track of their development hardware, because of course they don't want the development hardware to get in the wrong hands. And the idea here is that if a dish boots up, and it will report where it's located, basically. If it's within a development geofence, everything is fine. If it's outside of one of these geofences, SpaceX likely gets an alert. Most of these geofences make a lot of sense, like uh, a parking lot next to the SpaceX um, building. Some of them don't make a lot of sense. Like the picture on the right is the Connections Museum in Seattle, which for some reason is allowed to have development hardware. There's also some weirder locations in the code, um, like there's a, a villa in somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I don't know who it belongs to, so I'm not going to uh, share the location. If you zoom in far enough on Google Maps, you can actually see that there are likely some user terminals on top of that parking lot. So if someone really wants development hardware, that might be the place to go. Now that we have the firmware, we can also start looking at how the login prompt works. Um, and it's clear that basically the dish um, will print development login enabled. Then it does a check. If it's development hardware, it will print yes and set a root password. If it's not, then no password is set and you're unable to log in. Now, if we go down a bit more to the physical level, um, this is a logic analyzer capture of the UART output. You can see it prints development login enabled. Then there's a two millisecond gap, and then it says no. Now, it would be very interesting for us, of course, if we can have this dish believe it is development hardware. And the way we're going to try and do that is using fault injection. So we're going to inject a fault somewhere in between the first print and the second print and hope that we get lucky. And if we're talking about fault injection with a flip chip package that exposes the die backside, we usually start thinking about quite fancy techniques like laser fault injection, body bias injection, or electromagnetic fault injection. But this board is very big. So this is the equipment we have in our lab with the dish next to it. The first picture is a micropositioning table that we would use for EMFI. But as you can see, the board is way too big to ever mount on this thing. On the right, we have a box where our uh, laser fault injection setup is in. And as you can see, the, the dish wouldn't even fit in that box. And of course, if you would want to do this attack in a real world scenario where the dish is mounted on a roof, um, yeah, getting a laser setup on a roof with an oscilloscope and so on is not very, very practical. Another issue we faced is that there are no open development kits. So we had to do the attack uh, black box. We didn't have data sheets. We didn't have open samples. We didn't even have a similar product from ST um, to try and do this attack on first. So there's a few more attacks we could try. We could try messing with the clock. But with a system on chip, there's likely to be PLLs that inhibit clock glitches. We could try glitching the reset line. But what I ended up choosing is voltage fault injection. So initially, we started with a relatively simple setup. We connected the chip sprayer light to the core voltage supply of the SOC. Uh, I left all of the decoupling capacitors on the board, because when an SOC is completely booted up, it is quite vulnerable to um, voltage glitches, because it is already being pushed to its limits, basically. The chip sprayer can, of course, be controlled from Python, where we can set um, an offset and a glitch width. And we have an external oscilloscope that's not shown on the slide that triggers on the UART output. So this is a one result that you can get. So the dish prints development log and enabled, and yes. But at the same time, we cross a null pointer dereference in the kernel. 
and the entire system comes crashing down. Now, occasionally you get really lucky, and it prints development login enabled, yes. You can log in with the username root and the password falcon, and then you root and you can play around with the system. So this was nice because it showed that the SOC is susceptible to voltage glitching. The attack was easily reproducible, um, by SpaceX even. And it's quite easy to inject some fault, but most of them are undesirable. And this also meant that the attack is quite unreliable. We only get one attempt every 12 seconds because we have to reboot the dish to try one attempt. And it, was, it had a low success rate, so it would take many, many hours before you get lucky. So I decided to move up into the boot chain and go to the earlier boot stages. Um, so this SOC implements ARM trusted firmware, meaning that it has a ROM bootloader as well as some eFuse memory. These eFuses store, among other things, the root of trust public key, and the ROM bootloader will use that root of trust public key to verify the next stages that are stored on the EMMC. So in more detail, the ROM bootloader, or BL1, will load BL2, or the certificate of BL2 from the EMMC. The certificate in this case was a custom format made by ST. It contains a, a hash digest and a signature over that digest. Then the ROM bootloader will verify the certificate, so it will verify that the signature is valid. Then it loads the next stage firmware, the firmware itself, and computes the hash and compares the, the hash. It computes, matches the one stored in the certificate. Now, if you've done something like this before, I guess you see that there's two very obvious uh, moments in time where you would try to glitch the, the, the SOC. So one is the signature verification, the second one is the hash comparison. Now, because this is a completely black box scenario, you have really no clue where in time you have to insert a glitch and which of these two positions might work best for you. So it boils down to a lot of different attempts, basically, until you get lucky. This is the setup we made to experiment with these things. A few things you can do in a black box scenario are, of course, um, trying to boot a dish with an invalid signature, an invalid hash, or an invalid firmware image. You can also try to glitch a valid certificate into resulting in a signature verification failure. And all of these things combined help you to narrow down the right location in time and the other glitch parameters. In the top right of this slide, you can see an EM probe on top of the die. This is the same corner where the four CPU cores are located. And this gives us an, uh, some side channel information. I also removed most of the decoupling capacitors in this case, because the, when the ROM bootloader is executing, only a single core is running, and it's running at a lower clock frequency. And this makes it less susceptible to voltage glitches. This is a side channel trace with the serial output in black and the side channel in blue. Um, at this stage in time, basically, the dish is printing. Um, I have loaded the certificate, and I'm going to start checking the signature. And you can see that once the last byte of UR data is loaded into the buffer, it will already start the signature um, verification. And this is very useful side channel information for us as the attacker, because occasionally when you want to skip a, a certain function, it's easier to glitch at the start of the function. And using the side channel information, we know that this computation is already starting when there is still serial data coming out. So what we found is if we glitch at the exact start of the signature verification, that we can skip it entirely. So basically, the dish prints, I loaded the certificate. I'm going to check the signature. And immediately after, it says uh, signature is valid. I'm going to continue booting. And you can also obviously see from this side channel trace that the entire operation is being skipped. This was nice because that, this means that we can execute our own second stage bootloader and we can start reading memory regions. And this way I figured out that um, the ROM bootloader is mapped at the address shown on the slide and it is readable from the second stage. So this means we can dump the ROM bootloader and start analyzing it. I emulated the ROM bootloader in Unicorn Engine and tried fuzzing it with AFL++. But in this way, I didn't find any software vulnerability. And of course, the software vulnerability would have been nice to make the attack more scalable. I also tried simulating my fault attack in Unicorn Engine. Um, and I did this by simulating um, a basic fault model that assumes a single instruction skip. It turns out that a single instruction skip wouldn't actually result in a successful glitch. And this is because there are countermeasures in implemented in the ROM bootloader to prevent this type of attack. So obviously, the countermeasures that are implemented are not using the correct model for this specific hardware. 
So here's an example of when your glitch would be detected by a fault injection countermeasure. So the first stage of, uh, the first part of this output is basically the dish saying it has loaded the certificate and that it is starting a signature verification. And in this case, the certificate that we loaded onto the EMMC memory contains an invalid signature. So the signature should fail. But we glitch the dish, it continues booting, it loads the second stage, it verifies the hash. But then at the final end, it says authentication error. And this is because there are certain control flow checks implemented in the code that, that basically um, got our glitch. Um, there's some more information on the slide about how this is implemented exactly, uh, but I don't have a lot of time to go into this today. An issue we face now is that we didn't find a software vulnerability in the ROM bootloader, meaning that we would have to glitch the ROM bootloader every single time we reboot the dish. And the annoying part here is that we have to remove the decoupling capacitors to get the glitch to work on the ROM bootloader. But if you remove too many decoupling capacitors, you can no longer boot Linux because the system is way too unstable. So I basically had to figure out a way to switch on and off decoupling capacitors at will. This took a lot of manual experiments with different MOSFETs, uh, different yeah, high side or low side switching, different gate voltages, MOSFET drivers, capacitor sizes, uh, the way I was timing the glitch and so on. So the first picture on the left is a hand soldered attempt that didn't work. The second picture is the first attempt that did actually work. So this meant that we could glitch the ROM bootloader and end up in a root shell on Linux. This is nice because we demonstrated that the full attack works, but it's currently still in a lab scenario, right? We have an oscilloscope, we have power supplies, signal generators, and so on, so it's not really a portable setup. So doing this on a roof would be very inconvenient. Uh, at this point, I contacted SpaceX. I told them I had the entire attack working. They were nice enough to offer me a YubiKey that would allow me to SSH into the user terminal. But I decided that I was way too far down the rabbit hole, and I didn't accept their offer. So I wanted to make a mobile setup. Um, I wanted to remove the oscilloscope and all of the other lab equipment um, out of the setup and make a mobile setup. This is the first um, prototype, you could say, using a Raspberry Pi Pico to trigger and to inject the glitch. This worked, but it's, of course, still messy. So I wanted to make uh, a mod chip. To make the mod chip, I put the dish under a flatbed scanner. Um, and this gives you a nice one-to-one -one, um, resolution uh, image of the picture that you can load in Inkscape. You can then draw the board layout, export that to KiCad, and, and then you can start making your PCB. This is the finished product. So we have a Raspberry Pi microcontroller overclocked to 250 megahertz um, to the triggering and glitching. This microcontroller basically controls the MOSFET driver, and that MOSFET driver will switch on and off the decoupling MOSFETs and also insert the glitch using the crowbar MOSFET. The board is about six centimeters tall, and I used a 0.8 millimeter thick board. One of the goals of this talk is that other people can start playing with the Starlink system and also the infrastructure. And that means that also the mod chip design is available on GitHub. Uh, the repository is still private, but I will make it public later today. This is a picture of the mod chip installed. So there's a few wires that you also have to connect. So I'm connecting to a wire that allows me to enable and disable the voltage regulator so that I can basically power cycle the SOC. I'm leeching 12 volts from the user terminal to uh, drive the MOSFETs and 1.8 volts for a level shifter. This is the setup that someone at our university made so that we could um, simply hang the dish outside of a window from the lab so we wouldn't always have to go up to the roof if something broke. So at this point, everything worked. I had to root on the user terminal. I could connect to the network. I had internet access, and I was ready to start playing with the network infrastructure. And then I read some Reddit posts saying the new firmware is a lot better and it's way more stable. And of course, because I have the dish mounted flat and right up to the sky, the internet connection wasn't very stable. So I made the big mistake of doing a firmware update. Um, I had assumed I can glitch the ROM bootloader. There is no way that SpaceX can stop me at this point. It turned out that they had an e-fuse they could blow that would stop the dish from outputting any information over UART. So if you take a dish today and you try to connect to the UART port, it will not output anything. And my mod chip was, of course, using UART to trigger and then glitch. This means that we have to improvise, adapt, and overcome. 
I was lucky enough that I started working on this quite early, so I had a lot of data um, from yeah, the previous experiments. So I could compare logic analyzer captures from before they blew the fuse and after they had blown the fuse. And of course, I had this very nice side channel trace. And as it turns out, if you have the side channel trace and you take a side channel trace of the uh, dish with a blown fuse, you can visually spot this pattern and figure out where you have to insert the glitch. So then I, I'm basically now triggering on the EMMC data zero line instead of UART. And I could luckily adapt my mod chip to still work with this. It's a bit ugly because I have to add an, uh, yeah, a botch wire basically to make it work, uh, but it does work. The alternative would have been to make a new PCB design, uh, but I didn't get around to doing that. So at that point, we can start looking, of course, at the network. Um, and here things don't really get easier because the ST safe secure element is being used to implement mutually authenticated TLS with every backend server, meaning that you can't easily intercept the data and modify it and so on. This meant that I started adding ST safe support to TLS libraries. Um, I chose TLS Lite NG, which is a pure Python implementation because that made things easier for me. And then I wrote a Python script that um, allowed me to download the latest firmware updates before SpaceX assigns them to this, this specific user terminal. So whenever someone posts on Reddit saying I have a new update and this is the, the update version, I can immediately go and, and fetch it. So I also started collecting all of these firmware updates and I have my own archive now. And this is convenient to see what they changed over time in the, in the firmware. Most of the communication with the backend is over IPv6, meaning you can't easily scan all of the hosts. Um, the main host does have quite a few ports open. But here, basically, I'm hoping that other people will start glitching their own user terminal and will start looking at the network infrastructure. So what else can you do if you build your own mod chip and start working on a user terminal? As I said, you can start exploring the network infrastructure. But you can also start playing with the, the beam formers. So it's clear that the user terminal is able to override firmware on the beam former ICs themselves. So I think some people are interested in playing with this firmware and seeing what else they can do with the beam formers. You could also try to repurpose your terminal. So maybe you could use two user terminals to implement a point-to-point -point link or something like that. Um, the picture in the slide shows basically some binaries that are in the firmware that allow you to do some diagnostics of the, the beam formers. So with that, I want to conclude this talk. Um, so it turns out that we can bypass secure boot using voltage fault injection in the ROM bootloader. We did this on a custom quad-core Cortex-A53 in a completely black box scenario, meaning we had no documentation and we had no open development samples or development kits. We uh, came up with a way to enable and disable decoupling capacitors. And voltage, uh, of course, the fault injection countermeasures are only as good as the fault model that was used to develop them. And in this case, the fault model used to develop the fault uh, injection countermeasure wasn't a realistic model. So from a security standpoint, I think this is a, a well-designed product. Um, there was no obvious, at least to me, low-hanging fruit. And in contrast to many other embedded devices I've looked at in the past, even if you get a root shell, it is still quite challenging to find an attack that scales. I think there's a lot of device manufacturers that should take a look at this device and, and learn a thing or two. Um, the SpaceX product security incidents response team was very responsive and helpful. Um, when I broke the dish, they were happy to replace it and so on. So before I really end this presentation, I'm going to attempt to do a live demo. Um, it is a live glitching demo. A glitch is never deterministic, so it can take one minute, it can take five minutes. Um, five minutes is the longest it's ever taken, so let's see if we get lucky today. Um, you can find the GitHub link here on the slide. If you have more questions, you can, you can find me later or, or send me an email. So on the left, we have a Python script that is basically communicating with the mod chip. It can set glitch parameters, and it can orchestrate the attack. If you were to make a new PCB revision, and you can also read the UART data on the Raspberry Pi microcontroller, then you could, of course, also make this standalone, so you wouldn't have to have a computer attached to the dish. So by pressing Enter, um, we are trying to glitch the dish at this point. On the right, we have a serial terminal, and as you can see, it's not outputting anything because that serial fuse is blown on this dish. 
So in the past, when I initially started doing this research, the dish would constantly reboot and say invalid signature, and you would see it really doing something. Now you will only see it do something when the glitch is successful. And this is the point where we wait. Um, <laughs> so maybe if, if someone already has a question, I, I can try to answer a question in the meantime. At this time, we don't have any virtual questions, but in audience, please feel free to use the microphones. I was your level of effort 100, 1,000, 10,000 hours to do this? Like what kind of scale are we talking yeah, about? That's, that's a common and very difficult question to answer. Um, so I, I work at the university where I do research and we, we never really work full time on a single project. Um, so all of the research was done over the time span of one year. So from getting the user terminal to having everything working. Um, but it's, it's difficult for me to say how many hours I, I really spent on this. But you can imagine that it, it took quite a significant amount of time. Yeah. There we go. Glitch is successful. So to get this to work, I also had to patch every single boot stage to remove the signature verification. Um, you can also see that I modified U-boot so you had more time to type Falcon and get into the command line interface. So finally, when the dish completes booting, we can log in using the username root, if I get it correct, and the password Falcon, and we are root. Now we can, for example, do uh, this. And this shows us all of the logging messages that are implemented. And it gives a lot of interesting information while the dish is booting, but also while the dish is running. So for example, what you can see when the dish is already connected to the satellite network is it will print which satellite it is connected to, when it thinks it's going to lose connection, and then the new satellite it is going to connect to. And you have live satellite trackers online, and you can really see the dish connecting to the satellite it's flying over and so on. So with that, um, I want to end the talk. Um, thank you all for being here.